take a quick look at the flow of today's session. Please refer the agenda that is going to be displayed on your screens right now. Our speakers for the day are Mr. Saurabh Jain, Mr. Pulkit Gupta, Mr. Vivek Sharma, Mr. Sunil Kumar, Mr. Ravi Ivani, Ms. Shweta Shivastav, and Mr. Manju Devdas. A promising agenda with an eminent lineup of speakers, isn't it? Well, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome and thank everyone for being a part of this virtual conference today. With this, let's kick start with the opening speaker of the day. I would like to invite our opening speaker, Mr. Saurabh Jain, Customer Engineer Analytics, Google Cloud to share his views with us. And that's a small intro about him. Welcome, Mr. Jain. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, we've given you the presentation rights now, Saurabh. Uh, yeah, we've given you the presentation rights, so you can go ahead and present. Yeah, we are able to see your slide. Uh, over to you now. Uh, sir, we are not able to hear you. I think you're on mute. Can you please unmute yourself? Uh, why just this again, guys? Sure, sure. No problem. No problem. Just a bit new to the WebEx part. Uh, can you unmute me? Because I'm. I'm yeah, we've unmuted. Yeah, you sure. are uh, unmuted. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So could yes. you just present your slides now? Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Neil, for that. Uh, thanks, everyone. Sorry for this uh, minor glitch from my side. Uh, a very warm uh, good morning to everyone, uh, and thanks for having me for this session. Uh, today, I'll be walking you through a smart analytics uh, a journey uh, as a part of your AI. Okay. So when we talk about uh, AI, okay, so the core part of every organization is the data, right? And at Google, we believe that every company in the future, regardless of its size, shape, or industry, will differentiate themselves through technologies, right? Uh, every organization that today we see are making decisions based on the data, be it their business decisions, be it their roadmap, be it their strategy, be it their investments, it's all based out of data. And that's where we believe that in future, every, every company, be, be any of its size, will all become a data company. Now, this is based on the fact that uh, there's a report by the IDC that says that by 2025, we'll be having approximately 175 zettabytes of data being generated. Okay. When I talk about a zettabyte, a zettabyte is approximately a million petabytes. Okay. And that, to, to be honest, that is becoming true because we have multiple customers in the GCP platform that are actually running through thousands of petabytes of storage as of today itself while I'm talking to you. Okay. So this 175 zettabytes that we're looking at looks very practical. Okay. And having said that, that so much of data would be being generated, okay, it's very important that if a company isn't good at analytics, it's not ready for AI. Okay, that's one of the reviews by the Harvard in 2017. And that's what we are seeing is that it's a very, very fundamental step that we start using the data, leveraging the power of the data. Now, having worked with multiple customers organizations, these are the top five teams that we are seeing from most of the organizations, okay, while COVID has enforced, okay, prompted most of the organizations to move towards the cloud, but it was essentially becoming one of the major, major themes that most of the organizations were adapting to, okay? But cloud is just one place where you actually store the data, process the data, and get the business insights, okay? But the other themes which are actually generating the data and leveraging this data, we are seeing the trends among the AI ML, where there's enough of data, but to find out those hidden patterns, okay? So that's one of the themes. IoT, where we have already seen the capabilities that IoT is bringing to everywhere across the globe. It has already reached to the home as well. So we have smart home devices that we're connecting it to and it's generating a lot of data. VR, AR, the virtual augmented reality, virtual reality. So we are seeing that 
in, in order to increase the customer experiences, in order to increase more engagement with the customers, organizations are leveraging the capabilities of VR AR. And finally, the fintech and the regulatory industry, where still uh, they are adopting to the cloud, but still we see that most of the organizations which are in the fintech looks to manage the transactions, compliance, and risks. So we have to ensure that we are also abiding to those compliances and the risks to ensure that they, they are running the businesses smoothly without any risks of a non-compliance. So having seen this across themes, what Google Cloud opens is its technology to everyone. Okay. When I say Google Cloud opens Google technology to all, it's the same technology that Google has been running most of its applications for over the decades. Okay, so what we offer is that infrastructure as a service. So it's the standard infrastructure that we talk about, like the VMs, machines, servers. But apart from that, what really differentiates us is those three pillars that we talk about, like a smart analytics as a service, which we will see through this session today. Data management, where how you persist your data in a much, much different way as compared to what tools we have in market. And finally, application platforms to host your business applications. Across all three, across all through these pillars, most important thing is that productivity, how organizations get productivity out of it. Okay. It's not just using these tools, it's to be productive in a much, much efficient way. Okay. And how do you actually transform your business? That's where Google differentiates across all these components. But to be honest, what really makes Google Cloud different, right? So if I have to list, list the top five things that really differentiates, it's a first thing is the security. So when we talk about security, Google believes security is a must. And that's where we say that every Google service that you use is encrypted or secured by default. Customer doesn't even have to talk about security, encryption, everything, because everything is secured by default. Customer doesn't have an option to leave it unsecured. So data, everything is encrypted while it is in rest, while it is in transit. Second is hybrid and multi-cloud. So Google accepts that, that there are customers who work on multi-cloud, okay, who want to work in a hybrid way. So we, we accept that. We don't force customers to come on GCP. If they are running on a different cloud provider, we appreciate that. And that's where we are releasing more and more technologies that adapt to both the environments, right? Like to give them a flexibility that yes, you can do the same thing in Google as well, the same thing from a different cloud provider as well. Third thing, fully managed no ops. So when we talk about fully managed no ops, the Google's principle is that everything has to be serverless, right? Whenever any organization is adopting to any workloads, any transformations, we shouldn't waste time on servers procurement, server sizing, how much core, how many RAM and so on, right? Like the focus should be on the business, the focus should be on the application insights how to reach out to the customer strategies and so on. Just everything Google takes care of. Embedded AI and ML, okay, that's been the heart of the Google everywhere. Any service that you see today onto the Android platform or onto the web that Google provides has some element of AI ML in it, okay? And that's where we say that any service that we are offering, there will be some sort of an AI ML into that offering. And it has to be there in the next set of technologies that we'll be looking for. Finally, the best of Google. It's the culture that Google has built over the decades. That's what we want to share with the customers. So we don't want, you just don't want to sell services. You just don't want to sell platform. It's the innovation that we have seen over the years. We want to share with them and how customers can adopt to that innovation and we can work together. Now, having seen this, what really data analytics is and how GCP is different. Okay, so big data is in our DNA. Google has nine products, which has 1 billion monthly active users. Okay, so there are a total of 11 in the market where Google has nine of them, which are actually being managed for so many years now. Okay, be it uh, Play Store, be it YouTube, be it Gmail, be it Maps, Photos, and so on. Okay, so we are using uh, Google technology to actually support this a billion active users in a month. Now, talking about some of the big data problems, right? Like um, how, how Google offers it, how Google presents it. So Google has been working on these things for the past two decades now, right? Right from back in 2002, uh, when Google released white papers for the GFS, the file system, the map reduce, big table. Ultimately, all those white papers resulted into a component, which is today what we, the open source community and most of the other cloud providers are also using it. So be it Apache Hadoop, HBase. So they are all based out of some of the white papers that Google has released. And the journey continues. So if you see from today as well, like 
right from 2002 till, till date. So we have so many components that have released. Uh, and lately, if I were to talk about there is Kubernetes, Kubeflow, and so on. So Google is investing in research and ensuring that we give it back to the community. So these are the same components which Google has used to build the GCP platform, like a big query, PubSub, which is a message queuing, and so on, right? So if I were to talk about some of the tools, like uh, we have the Gmail, we have Maps, okay, they all run on this technologies that we are sharing with the customer. Right, so we have this experience of managing them 1 billion active users without any latencies. We want to share the technology with the customer. So what's a typical data analytics looks like, right? Uh, when we work on an organizations, uh, when you work on a few workloads, we say that we want to specify the hardware, right? How many servers do we need? Uh, what is the procurement time? How much lead time we have to give to the vendors to get the procure servers and so on. We provision them, we configure the software in them. Uh, we do some sort of a patching, OS installations, and so on. Once done, once the servers are ready, typically it takes a few months to do the first two activities. Then is where the business team comes and they start putting the data into it and start analyzing it. Okay. They try to put on those checkpoints that, yes, how my servers are running, are they seeing any downtimes, memory utilizations, and everything. They implement logging, monitoring. And once they have this data, they go on to the maintenance with it, right? Like, yes. What's the data that we are getting? Do we need to scale? Do we need to upgrade? Do we need to monitor anything extra, right? So if you see from this perspective, the real, real insights is into the analytics and the insight part of it here. The rest of the things are just something which really doesn't add to a business value. So if you see here, right, like I said, the first, the other four parts are marked in red are something that just adds no value to the business. It's purely the analytics and insights that business should be focusing on, okay? And that's where Google comes into picture and talks about something called as a serverless data platform. We say that don't worry about servers, don't worry about scale, just send us the data, just write your logic into the pipelines and just run analysis, right? So we don't say that you have to worry about whether you'll be getting one GB of data or one petabyte of data whether you're gonna scale at a thousand message per second or maybe a million per second. What we say is that, yes, you send us the data, rest everything Google will be taking care of. It. So that's the offering that Google gives us to the organization so that the GTM is very fast. Having said that, uh, what really drives uh, Google's cloud, right? So it's more about converging the architectures, the technologies that we've been discussing over the last five to six years now, right? We talk about data lakes, we talk about data warehouses, we talk about streaming, batch processing, we talk about analytics, AI, ML, okay? And finally, there are a lot of organizations which talk about, I want a hybrid approach. What Google is doing is converging this into a single platform without even having to learn multiple skills, multiple platforms. It's the same service which a data engineer uses, same service can be leveraged by a data science team so that the GTM, the onboarding becomes very quick, okay? How to converge all those into a single platform without really having to worry about 10 different products, 10 different versions, 10 different setups, licenses, and so on. That's where the idea is of converging into a single platform and taking it to the customer. So this is the complete solution uh, from a data analytics, uh, smart analytics as a service. So right from collecting the data, processing the data, storing, analyzing, and visualizing it. So most of the services that we're talking about here, okay, have been into the productions for more than a decade, I would say, which Google has been leveraging so far. And there are a lot of new features that we're talking about, like recently Google acquired Looker. Looker is an enterprise-wide platform for analyzing all your data, right? Some of the new things that Google is doing is the Omni, BigQuery Omni, which talks about how, what if you have a data in AWS? What if you have a data in Azure? Is it possible that Google can query all that data without really having to migrate it? The true, truly hybrid approach, right? A multi-cloud strategy. Yes, Google has done that. Google is offering an alpha project. It's running an alpha project as of now, very soon to be in a beta, where we say that, yes, if you have data across the different cloud providers, but you have challenges in migrating it, yes, we offer you the capability to run that into a single interface via the Google Big Query, right? Similarly, there have been a lot of services, a lot of innovations which Google is doing and would love to share with the organizations so that the digital transformation is very smooth and very quick. 
Now talking about the services, Google provides choice to the customers, right? Like some of the services that we offer are very cloud native, right? So they've been built to scratch by Google and Google is the one who's offering them, right? At the same time, Google doesn't believe in a lock-in, right? Like if you're building some applications, Google wants to take you, if you want to run that same technology in somewhere outside, yes, possible to do it. If you want to take it onto your on-premise, yes, you can take it without having to rewrite the entire uh, workloads and transformations that you have been running, right? So we offer something called the managed open services, right? So these are the same components which are available as an open source. Google provides the capability to take it from either from on-premise to GCP or from GCP to on-premise or any other providers without having, without any issues. And finally, partner services that we talk about, like if there are certain platforms which are being needed by organizations, which GCP doesn't provide as of today, then we have a tie up with a lot of partners that actually provide those services in a managed way onto the GCP platform. Finally, uh, talking about AI, right? Like AI has been hard for the Google. Okay, we have seen AI across most of the products. Like when we talk about Gmail, we had smart recommendations. When you look at the photos, detecting the people who are in the photos. So Google is ensuring that AI is every place, right? And that's where, that's what we want to take it back to the organization. So what really uh, customers see when they come to Google for the AI is the scale. Thousands of machines available in a few seconds, okay, for running the training, the models, machine learning, and so on. The speed, okay, when we talk about speed, the GPUs, TPUs of the best qualities, okay, how to enable the data science team to get onboarded, not in months, but I would say a few couple of days, okay, with the same interface which they are used to. The quality, some of the pre trained models, like globally, people have been using in terms of translations, in terms of uh, detecting objects in the photos videos and so on, right? So the same same has been offered to customers to use those pre-trained models. And finally, accessible, okay? So whatever we are offering, we're ensuring that it's not only for the data science, but we're data science team primarily, but it's for the core developers who have just started their journey into this uh, technology fields. So we want to ensure that AI is available for everyone, not only for the ones who are purely into data science team, right? And that's how we uh, onboard the customers. Okay, we provide them tools which they can learn to it very quickly. So this is the range of services. I would not go into much details, but uh, some of the building blocks, like we talk about from the developer's perspective, where they want to really play around with the GPU, TPUs, and some of the frameworks which Google has released, like a TensorFlow and so on, to the solutions where a ready-made solutions like a contact center AI, or maybe a recommendation AI or a document AI, right? So Google provides services across all these building blocks, right? It's up to the customers at whichever layer they want to leverage. Yes, it's available through a single interface, okay, without having to get into much of a fuss about it. And these are some of the customers' journey, okay, who has uh, who are onto the Google Cloud platform, uh, be it across the geography or be it across the domain, right, from retail to auto transformation, manage, manufacturing, or digital natives. We have seen customers successfully onboarded to this journey. And that's why we would like to get more customers and not really get them onto the GCP, but actually work with them, innovate them, okay, and how to take it to the market in a more, more much more partnership way, as opposed to just sending out the services. That's what the Google mission is to work with the customers, innovate and take it to the market. Yeah. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it back to Nihil and you take queries if any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jain. That was a very informative session. Uh, we will have certain uh, questions for sure. We'll be taking them up in the Q&A session after the panel discussion. I would like to now invite our next speaker for the session, Mr. Pulkit Gupta, Senior Cloud Tech Lead from Pluto 7 to share his views with us. Welcome, Mr. Gupta. Thank you, Nehal. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, yes, we can hear you well. And we put the presentation slides. Uh, I hope you're able to present. Yeah, we've given it. Thank you. This bringing up my screen. Uh, 
I hope you people yes, can see, to see your screen. Just a moment. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Pulkat Gupta. And I'm based out of Delhi. At Pluto Seven, we Pluto Seven has been a Google partner since years now, and we are specifically working in the domain of data analytics and machine learning. In fact, for our efforts in the year 2019, we have received the award of Partner of the Year in Data and Analytics from Google Cloud. In, in all these five years, we have been uh, connecting with a lot of clients across the globe, specifically in India and the US. One thing that we largely, the one message that we largely convey to our customers uh, when we are talking about digital transformation is that it is a journey. It cannot be done overnight. And if you really want to see the impact, positive impact on your business, then you have to embark on that journey. You have to start somewhere. And then along with Google Cloud, we can reach the heights. And in, these, in all these years, we have worked on a lot of use cases. But the 15 use cases that have been listed over here are something that our team has worked time and again. Be it the domain of marketing, sales, supply chain, we are trying to uh, transform all of these domains and the business of our customers uh, with, with the technologies uh, by, provided by Google Cloud. Pluto 7 is different from other, uh, other service providers because Pluto 7 has the support of Google Cloud and it, it tries to understand the business, the nuances of your business, and then tries to deliver and strategize the approach on top of, top of it. We try to enrich your customer experience. We try to provide your business growth with the analytics. We try, we try and help our customers in risk management. And we try to take them from their legacy systems to the modern platforms. We still see that there are certain folks who are on legacy systems and with the extraordinary circumstances right now, they all want to move on to uh, the, the niche technologies, niche platforms that are available today. And again, the same message that it is a journey. It cannot be done overnight. But we understand that it is not possible for everybody to start from scratch. It is not possible for everybody to invest that much resources and time. So we have, with our experience with other clients, we have prepared certain solutions that are available on GCP marketplace and can be readily used by the customers. Mind you, it's not a product, it's a solution. So what I mean by that is that these solutions are 60% to 70% ready to use. But the data, data differs from you know, different verticals, uh, be it healthcare, be it automotive, be it manufacturing, data differs from vertical to vertical. And that is where this 30% customization kicks. Our team of data scientists, data engineers, basically explores your data, understands your data, and then pre-process it, makes it ready for the machine learning models. That is where this 30% customization comes in. But mind you, we can accelerate your journey with these solutions and can transform your business with our solutions. Data analytics and AI, a very loosely used term nowadays. But in the core of it lies a lot of things. We have to have an understanding of how the business is working. We have to have an understanding the nuances of data. And then only we can talk about data analytics. Data analytics can be diagnostic analytics, and it can be descriptive analytics, it can be predictive analytics, or it can be prescriptive analytics. Pluto 7 is working on all the fronts with its customers across the globe. And as uh, Saurabh mentioned in his presentation, when we are talking about analytics, it starts from the collection of data to transform, to analyze, to visualize, and then to activate. 
So again, there lies the whole journey that we have to go through when we are talking about the analytics. And this is something that we have been doing time and again with our customers. One of them being a public utility company uh, based out of US. They provide to they provide the power to large cities like California. Now, problem here is that they have a lot of data with them, structured, unstructured, audios, videos. And what we are doing with them is providing them the platform for collating all of their data and to generate the insights from them. The reason being that we have to enable them to take real-time decisions. We have to enable them for predictive risk management. We have to enable them with the, uh, with the management of data. And that is where Google Cloud comes in. We are Americans. This is something on the lines of Western Union, uh, what we have in India. The way Western Mood Union enables the uh, movement of money, the same way We Americas helps you, helps the uh, customers in USA. There we worked with them to, uh, to enable them to do agent of a, for a default analysis. So if any agent is about to default, then we can uh, warn them that about it. And accordingly, the company can take the measures. Again, the journey started on a very simple notes in moving their data to GCP and then building the machine learning and AI blocks on top of it. One thing we need to understand again is that all of the things are done, all of the components on GCP are serverless. So that allows the movement of large amounts of data without any issues. Dexterity. This is another customer of ours in USA, and this is a genomics research company. Now, when we are talking about the analysis of gene data, we, we, we all can understand how critical it is. And they were, they were processing uh, petabytes of data altogether. Now, their problem was that their one analysis was taking 210 hours. This is where we connected with them. We created a a science platform uh, for them on GCP. And again, now they are doing the same thing in just three hours. That is the kind of impact that we are making on their business. And on the other hand, from the cost front, one analysis used to cost them $178, which is now costing them only $10. That is, that is the kind of positive impact we are talking about. Another customer of ours is ABN Bev. So this is the one of the largest breweries in the world. When we say the beer brands of Budweiser or Corona, they all come from ABN Bev. They had a very unique problem with their plan. They used to use K2 filters and they used to replace these filters according to their standard observations. Now, there could be a scenario that these filters might get exhausted before three months or before the time they have changed it, or uh, these filters might have some life even when they are changing it. On both the lines, it is the loss to the company. So we built them the machine learning model, which was able to predict the sweet spot when they have to change those filters. It increased the uh, amount of beer manufacturing by 60% with the same filters. Again, a positive impact. And again, this particular client is on a journey with us. Cloud for marketing. With the extraordinary circumstances that we see now with COVID-19, it becomes very important that we serve our customers well. We understand their grievances. We understand uh, how what they want or what are their sentiments regarding their uh, our products? That is where the cloud for marketing framework comes in, where we try to uh, transform the existing framework, marketing framework of the companies with the technology of Google Cloud and the experience of Pluto Seven. There could be n number of use cases, and this is this is you know just a list that uh, that is there for for you to refer. 
companies bring in more of their use cases uh, as per uh, their requirement, and we work on them. Uh, we readily work on the, uh, those use cases. Elnutra. This is a company based in US that basically works on creating the food products for the healthy lifestyle. These people uh, were on legacy system. We brought their data on GCP and now we are working further with them for building the uh, cloud for marketing use cases. And the only idea here is to provide the right choice for the right customers. Be it, you know, the uh, personalization, be it, you know, the uh, right services, be it, uh, you know, the uh, kind of kind of a response that customers want from any other. This is a jewelry customer in US. And these people, again, were, a, uh, were on a system that was developed in 2009. They were, they were facing a lot of issues with that system. We talked to them, we, we convinced them to bring their data onto GCP. And we are again working with them on C4M use cases to make their customers happy. And in turn, uh, grow the business. Document. This is another framework of Google Cloud, where we talk about you know, understanding the documents. In today's scenario, Let's take up any vertical, be it manufacturing, be it uh, healthcare, be it hospitals, be it uh, education. We process a lot of documents day in, day out. Is there a way to automate the whole stuff? Yes, it available and it can easily be done with Google Cloud. That is something that we have done with one of our customers who is a real, uh, real estate loan processing company. They used to process the same documents day in, day out, and that to manually. It was a tedious task. It, uh, you know, human errors used to creep in. And again, nobody likes to do that repetitive task again and again. That is where the, we took the power of Google Cloud. The APIs, the machine learning uh, that is available on Google Cloud, and built them the solution uh, that, that automated the whole uh, process. And with that, we were able to reduce the turnaround time by 75 to 80%. That has been the power uh, that we are delivering to our customers. Center AI. It often happens then when we call to the customer care centers, we are compelled to listen to, to, to the IVR systems or to wait for minutes before we can actually tell our grievances to the customer care center. Can we change that? Can we improve the uh, uh, customer? Can we improve the customer's response time? Can we improve the customer's experience? That is where contact center comes in, where we are trying to create the chatbots, where we are trying to connect those chatbots with your telephony system, with intelligent virtual agents that can handle conversations on their own without any human intervention. And that is something that we have done with LNT in India. They have lots of customer sites across the across the uh, country, but they used to generate those. Uh, they used to generate the weekly reports for those sites as to what material has come in, what has been used, and and all those things. But those reports were weekly reports. What if someone is looking for a uh, for a analysis? What if someone wants the, wants the information in the middle of a week? There was no system available to them. We prepared a chat chatbot for them that was deployed on their mobiles using Google Assistant, and now they are able to have those, those that information within their reach within seconds. Where we have connected that chatbot with their backend system to allow the uh, seamless integration. Similar kind of work we have done for University of New Mexico, where we have tried to uh, integrate the information from different spe uh, specialty hospitals, so that even if a even if a patient that is having a kidney disease enters in a hospital having some kind of heart disease, 
at least they can be given a preliminary treatment with the help of these chat bots and many others. With Pluto 7, this, is, this has been our enterprise business model, which we have been following since years now. We start, uh, we, we totally understand that right now, you know, uh, there are a lot of customers, there are a lot of people in the, uh, in the market that might not be having the clear idea around GCP, that might not be having the clear idea how they can start with their journey, how they can, uh, how they can utilize AI ML for their workloads. That is where we talk about a one day ML workshop, where we sit with your executives, with your kids, and we try to understand your business, your problems, and then come up with the probable roadmap for you down the line. Once we have decided on the use case, we go further and talk about proof of concept. The, the reason of proof of concept is to prove the capabilities of Google Cloud, the capabilities of Pluto 7, and, uh, uh, and capabilities of AI ML to the business. And once, we, once the customers are satisfied with EOC, then we go for the production rollout. Again, the timelines and uh, those things can be discussed, can, can vary from customer to customer based on the requirement. So yeah, that's pretty much it from my end. If you have any questions, please put it on the chat and I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pulkit. That was a very informative session. Now let's move on to the most awaited knowledge sharing and interaction session, the panel discussion. The discussion is around the topic roadmap to your AI journey. And we have some very interesting names here. The session will be moderated by Mr. Vivek Sharma, Senior Domain Specialist, Dan and Bradstreet, India. With this, uh, also let me introduce to you the speakers for the panel discussion today. Our first panelist for the session is Mr. Sunil G. Kumar. Head of Global Service Care Innovation, Nokia Networks India Private Limited. Thank you, Mr. Kumar, for joining us. Following him on the panel is Mr. Ravi Ivani, Head Technology, BFSI, Carvi Data Management Services Limited. Thank you, Mr. Ivani, for joining us. Next on the panel, is Ms. Shweta Srivastav, Chief Technology Officer, Paul Merchant Limited. Thank you, Ms. Srivastav, for joining us. We also have with us Mr. Manju Devda, CEO and Supply Chain Domain Expert, Pluto 7, joining us in the panel. Thank you, Mr. Devdas, for joining us. Thank you. I would request all our panel speakers to please come on video as well so that it becomes a little more interactive session and our audience is able to see. Over to you, Mr. Sharma. We shall begin the session now. Okay, I think uh, Mr. Vivek Sharma, are you able to hear us? Yes, yes, sorry, Nehan. Uh, uh, there was uh, the, the difference. No, was in it. Yeah. So, uh, what, I was, uh, no, trying, oh, what I was trying to say was that we heard two interesting presentations just now. And, you know, uh, we, are, we have got some interesting questions lined up, uh, which will provide us uh, uh, interesting insights, I'm sure. So uh, with that expectation in the background, I'm starting the panel discussion. So good afternoon uh, to all the panel speakers. And let me start my first question to Mr. S uh, which I'm putting to Mr. Sunil. And I'd like to get his views on uh, how technology is helping the workforce focus on high value tasks. So Mr. Sunil, if you can share your views on this particular question. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning and uh, uh, to all of you. And good evening for those of you who are the other side of the world. And uh, thank you, uh, Vivek, for this opportunity, and thanks, Dan and Bradstreet, for this opportunity to, you know, uh, be part of your panel uh, speaker list today. Uh, 
the question about the technology, uh, you know, helping the workforce uh, in, in high value tasks. So typically when you look at some of these things, it's possible to, you know, share this through examples, which we have in our own careers, in our own lifetime as well. Now, a very simple uh, concept is this particular virtual conference that we are having right now today, right? The early versions used to be in closed hotel rooms, um, you know, in meeting rooms and so on. And just with a click of a button from your mobile or your tablets or any of your devices that you are able to quickly connect to this conference, right? Whether it is Cisco or, or you know, any other Teams or you know, Zoom or any other application for that matter. So this virtual reality has become a new normal, as you all know. And in the context of Nokia, basically we believe that we want to change the world for a better place um, by you know, seizing the potential of technology to build a more connected and sustainable market. So that's our aim, uh, typically. So when you look across the industry, for example, in the years back, decades back, you used to have, uh, we used to have the Vodafone UK systems, for example, when I was a consultant, uh, we had legacy building platforms. And as the customer base increased, right, you had to put in a call center to answer these sessions and answer these queries and so on and so forth. So typically the average call was around three pounds per call. And if you have like 40,000 calls in a day, you have like roughly around 120, Okay, um, points, which is for a day, which is a quite huge amount, right? So as technology uh, evolved, right, it was really difficult to manage these in terms of real estate space and so on and so forth. I'm taking you like, you know, 15, 20 years back, 20 years, 25 years back, typically in time. And as the volume doubled, uh, typically when the customer base increased, it became easier than to put a simple static web page in, in, in place and with a with this list of you know guidelines and so on. So people were able to log in into the web page and then click it forward from there. So technology was used to divert the traffic and half of those calls were actually not technical at all. They were just general queries and you know, in uh, very, very simple ones. If you look at the uh, lease line connectivity, right? For example, when you look at at and uh, dedicated 64 kbps line, if you live in the US, for example, or in India, for example, when you have the 64 kbps ISDN lines in the past, right? You 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 typically take four to six months to get the lease line connectivity home, right? But today, when you have this pandemic, unfortunately, you know uh, the the COVID pandemic across the globe, this online collaboration has become seamless, as you see, right? So there's no, there's little or no or zero disruption, right, across the thing. So essentially. Uh, the concept of, you know, introducing the chatbots, like somebody already mentioned in the previous sessions, the concept of introducing, you know, uh, a comfort level for people so that you're actually not giving them a threat of what they're trying to do, but you're actually reskilling them for higher value added tasks. And, and that is typically what you want to look at as well. You anyway, know, we look at bank openings today. You don't have to go to the bank. We can just bring in a, a swipe machine and a, a fingerprint machine, and you can actually open a bank in a click of a, in, in a Jiffy, right, typically. So, and also you're, uh, someone is also talking about the um, detections using AI, right? So you have a water filters at home. Your filters are supposed to be changed. It's not very far away when you actually have auto detection for the replacement of these filters, right? So based on the water quality, you actually uh, have a trigger sent to the centralized database, and then they send someone to change the filters. So it's important when come somebody in your organization comes forward, you know, so you always look out for these suggestions. You measure who they are in terms in the teams they are and they are part of, and what are they suggesting basically, and what is it that on AI and ML that they are actually suggesting. And when one of these when one of these suggestions turns into a production project, you then reward that engagement, right? So it's a concept of the expectations, the engagement, the employee interaction, the effectiveness of the whole aspect as well. So that's something which I would like to quickly summarize on, you know, the technology Thank helping the workforce. Thank, Thank, you, you. For, Thank you for your views. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me bring in Mr. Ravi uh, to get his views on the same question about technology helping the workforce focus on high value. Uh, tasks. So, Mr. Ravi, if you can share your views. Yeah, hi Vivek. Uh, so, I'll keep it uh, short on this uh, aspect. Basically, the technology, as my uh, the, uh, counterpart, the other person has mentioned, actually, technology advances have entirely reshaped the organizations by making their businesses processes highly integrated and more streamlined. So, this is more so in case of smaller and medium enterprises today, run by which is few few people or small business need technology like nothing else actually. Technological advances have facilitated those businesses in running their tasks, actually smoothing their performing well and than ever before. So now when it comes to the data bit intelligence, this is a this, this is a uh, concept basically which is driving the workforce outside in the market and industries as of now. 
so now we'll we'll discuss you know when it comes to the next uh, um, uh, you know discussion points actually i'll share my thoughts and views actually as of now on this point i would like to conclude with uh, uh, this uh, mr vivek yeah thank you for that uh, uh, ms shweta if you can add some thoughts here on this particular question hi thank you so much for having me over uh, with the panelists so uh, my thoughts over this i think so we have covered most part of it that uh, since past few decades uh, there has been a tremendous revolution in uh, technology adoption and the penetration that we see in terms of technology even to the tier 2 to 2 and 3 six type of cities um look at the banking look at the retail health care the way we have transformed and it has all been possible only uh, with the adoption of technology so yeah the, the expectation of customers has gone high and uh, with the usage of right kind of technology the companies are able to meet all the expectations that the customer has okay okay thank you for that uh, mr manju i would like to get your perspective on a uh, different uh, but a very uh, you know kind of talked about uh, a topic these days uh, which is about the ai and i would like to know from you uh, you know your views on what is the role of ai in the age of uh, data because we are hearing so much about companies using data you yourself have spoken about it at length many times when we had discussion in the past so you know how does ai uh, help this aspect uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know utilization of data and also you know getting the most out of data your views here Sure. Th thanks for the question, and uh, thank you for the panelists uh, for for their views. Um, if you look at uh, the the role of AI and then how data and businesses converge or come together, yeah, uh, data is nothing but a representation of a business in motion, a business process. Okay. And if you take uh, knowledge workers uh, who work in businesses, thirty percent of their time is spent in searching for information. Yeah. The remaining 40-50 percent of the time is uh, trying to arrive at a decision, and the, really the decision making is about 20 percent of the time, broadly speaking. Where AI uh, and machine learning and text mining and all those things in a centralized data set really helps is helps you to majority of the 60-70 percent of the work faster and better, right. and that directly translates into uh, translates into ROI. Now, if you apply this concept into any industry, any vertical, and if you take knowledge workers, knowledge workers are people broadly who sit in front of a laptop and perform tasks. In other words, you know they're searching for information, making decisions, and you apply these um, AI, AI capabilities simply to take information and process it and make decisions for you, or as a digital twin. So then you 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 really need to make fewer decisions. um with with the available time now if we if it apply this across industry across within a given company in an industry and with different departments in an industry in that company and and look at you know like the cost of the labor and it's not just about the cost of labor and saving labor of course that every business wants to save but beyond that there are certain decisions humans cannot make like if you have to watch 1000 videos and and come up with you know did you find any unsecure uh, situations in those 1000 videos it's going to take you like 5000 hours uh, so it's not practical but you can run a video intelligence ai and arrive at that conclusion in a matter of 2 hours which yes. is so there are there are problems that humans can't solve and the even the business there are problems humans can't solve and where we can solve we do it at a much efficient way with ai where we cannot solve we leverage ai hope that gives a perspective yeah right that's really helpful thank you so much uh, uh, so uh, uh, i would like to put the same to shweta and get her views on this particular uh, particular question yeah, so uh, rightly said ai and data both are inseparable so we can we cannot imagine building an ai model in absence of data data is the food for uh, ai you know and uh, i personally coming from the financial background we are uh, doing a lot of lending decisions based on the ai modeling that we do so it is based on the alternate data or the customer profile uh, you know and the uh, rest of the available uh, conventional uh, mode of data that we collect so all of that data is collated and then based on the ai engine uh, model that we have developed the decision making is done this helps us in ensuring faster approval and processing uh, of the loans 
and uh, it helps us in creating a credit profile for the first time uh, loan applicants. Uh, so it brings down the service cost uh, altogether and it, obviously it helps us in ensuring the regulatory compliance and security of data, which is very important in these cases. So it, it is taken care of by PDP and uh, GDPR requirements as well. That's about it. Yeah. So for that, uh, Mr. Sunil, uh, I would like to get your views here uh, on this particular question of ro on role of AI in the age of uh, data. If you can add some points here. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I think uh, both the speak, uh, panel speakers, uh, you know, already clarified a few of these topics. But what I would like to also share is the data makes sense only if it is crunched for a useful purpose. So let's say prediction or you know proactive uh, analyst analytics and so on. So AI and machine learning, which is machine learning being a subfield of AI, is extremely good with analytics and prediction. If the data is organized and aggregated in such a way that it can be utilized to you know kind of grow customers, improve outcomes, and guide business decisions or key decisions, etc. Now AI is actually all pervasive and typically embedded into most of the systems today. But AI itself is not the solution. Uh, it is a tool. It's a means to achieve that solution. So all problems probably cannot be solved through AI again. So you need to be able to analyze what can be solved, what cannot be solved through AI, and then look at some of these things. For example, if you look at today's world in, the, in, the, in this uh, new normal, for example, again, I'm quoting uh, you know, a scenario here. You have the education industry, right? So now that everything has gone online, children cannot attend school anymore. Um, so you need to expand the reach and digitalization of online seminars are happening. And there are parallel online exercises and quizzes, just like this Minty quiz that we had just now, for example, right? So you have a lack of uh, students, I mean, there is a possible lack of activity of certain students who didn't contribute or didn't, you know, didn't actively participate, etc. So, how do you, as a, as a as a teacher or as a as a school principal or whatever it is, you want? How do you kind of uh, track the children who are not performing, right? So, the AI intervention on student data and focusing on the weak students who are non-performing, giving them more attention. The concept of holographic teachers and you know holography in the future, you know, this is those are the true AI applications of your AI applications as they call them telemedicine through rural health right uh, remote surgery the advent of 5g uh, you know using concept of network slices which we use and the industrial iot right so we have the industrial iot 4.0 which is uh, you know all pervasive going forward and uh, google itself has created a, a maths ai that has already proved like 12000 theorems for example you know imagine the combined power of you know further improvising on such theorem proofs and so on so in Nokia, we have a, a platform called the Nokia Ava platform, which is uh, basically uh, you know, an analytics and cognitive applications uh, use cases platform, which was launched in the Mobile World Congress in 2016. And uh, this was recognized as a leading solution in the telco AI and analytics space with lot, almost like 14 industry awards on the analytics and AI use cases for network applications, operations, industry first cognitive platform to inject analytics and, and automation into service delivery uh, use cases and so on. So these are some things which uh, basically have increasing role of the AI in the age of data and we look at even the, the COVID analytics. I mean, what is more important is in the past, there were no log files available or collated as such, right? So when these log files, uh, data log files started uh, data getting accumulated over, over decades, the systems and networks becoming more complex and the data availability being there, the need for AI increased and then the computing power also increased from the CPUs to VPUs, MPUs to the GPUs uh, today and so on. So that basically <laughs> makes it more feasible to make this happen. And if you look at the entire structure of this whole COVID situation also, for example, you need to have an introduction or background in terms of the clinical features, the transmission mechanism and so on, right? Then you have the related work of other people on uh, papers on clinical characteristics, you know, review papers and so on. Then you have the past pandemic information, which you have like the swine flu, the uh, Spanish flu and the older <clears throat> scenarios. Then, then there are these, um, you know, the different stages within COVID itself, for example, right? You have imported cases, sporadic cases, cluster of these cases, the community spread, and, and so on. So then, of, co of course, there is a diagnosis, the contact tracing, the sampling methods, the molecular tests, the serological tests, and so on. So then there is this treatment methods in terms of sym symptomatic treatment, vaccine efforts, the potential drugs which are coming now or not coming, for example. So the flattening of the curve, the social distancing, the recommendations of the world bodies, you know, the emerging technology in terms of IoT, UAVs, AI, blockchain, uh, drones, the 5G networks, et cetera, and so on, right? So you have drones for crowd surveillance, you have thermal imaging, 
you know, you have, uh, you know, making deliveries using drones with non-contacting and disinfecting areas. So robots now being used in hospitals and in autonomous vehicles, right? Wearables uh, in terms of respiratory um, rate, check, checking meters or measurements, contact tracing, you know, uh, telemedicine as a whole. So the mobile applications uh, are required. So it's all the ecosystem itself. So just by having a network or having some part of it and not the other you, you need an app to make it happen on a mobile if somebody didn't de develop that app the network cannot be used to make that happen so it's all a food chain as we call it right typically so uh, that is typically what i wanted to also kind of emphasize on the need <clears throat> okay neil can you confirm if i am audible we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sir, you're on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now let me move to the next question and bring Mr. Ravi. Uh, and uh, since we have heard a lot about AI and the data uh, linkages and uh, got some good understanding on this, let me ask Mr. Ravi to help us understand which are the areas uh, according to him in which AI is getting deployed. So if you can uh, share your views here, Mr. Ravi. Yeah, so as rightly our my panel members have spoke all it in the length, actually, there are so many areas like be it in an autonomous autonomous flying, retails, shopping and fashions, especially the e-commerce industry is actually as a, is a wind, like artificial intelligence is taking it as interesting. And at this point of the corona time, actually, we have seen this artificial intelligence helping the teams uh, elaborately. So be it a security, surveillance, so you take about sports analytics and activities and be it uh, aware of operation especially and uh, you know healthcare and uh, medical imaging and all, all these areas you know artificial intelligence is uh, is is uh, is uh, is actually uh, completely taking the market and to as a wind actually and it is taking and helping the teams do the efficiency in the uh, at this point of the pandemic situation so and of course now, now not but the least we have virtual assistants on chat box also which is helping artificial intelligence to the society so now to start business when it benefits the humans, there are multiple ways making their life more automated, which better accessibility and the control of around us. So, but now the one question is, you know, AI is possible into things, uh, into these things only when a model is well trained through the right and the machine learning training data, using the right algorithms to make it really functional into the relevant fields. So, without if you do not have a proper data which is not trained properly, that probably that artificial business may not give the expected outcome. So, now that is where actually many companies can provide the testing and the training data to develop IAI enabled models through machine learning. So, so these, these things and also work further with the available deep learning will help to integrate various uh, other uh, key areas taking the autonomous um, technology to the next level with uh, zero flaws and maximum efficiency. This is what actually I feel uh, it's, uh, areas in which AI is uh, developed, uh, so being developed, deployed. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, so I would like to uh, hear uh, uh, and get views of uh, uh, Mr. Manju here with respect to, you know, the key areas and especially since Mr. Sunil was uh, talking about uh, you know the health aspect you know what's uh, what what are the key areas that you have seen yourself mr manju ai getting ai being deployed and any experience that you would like to share with respect to the health uh, domain ai yeah, yeah. we looking at it getting applied in in every major vertical possible however if i have to pick uh, healthcare and retail as an example or as two examples um, within healthcare, uh, there are uh, three, let's say, broad categories of problems that are getting solved. One is uh, um, finding insights in massive amount of data. Massive amount of data, be it you know, to, uh, combining internal and external data from uh, healthcare agencies. We are working with large universities who in turn work with research organizations, with pharmaceuticals, uh, in finding vaccines or drugs. Uh, and and when you when they have to combine with population data and do that at scale and find patterns, uh, they need uh, they need they need AI to do that, right? And then it comes to we work with uh, gene sequencing companies where this is one of the uh, case studies that Pulkit presented earlier, 
where what costed $178 per test now costs like one, 95% cheaper than what it originally costed. So there are AI techniques, the machine learning and AI techniques on cloud that are getting applied on Google Cloud in this case. Um, then there are very basic and mundane repetitive problems that are being solved, uh, but very effective. For example, patient uh, patients come into the hospital and, and they fill in the form. The information is extracted, uh, personal identification are redacted so that that's not identifiable. And then it's uh, imported and process automations. So this is not just OCR, but it's also having intelligent workflow automation. So making it faster for onboarding patients. Then you have uh, patient insurance claims where machine learning AI is being adopted as the processing comes in to further whether identifying whether the claims are valid claims or, or invalid claims. Um, then there are image processing and video intelligence AIs where it's applied against chest x-rays where before a doctor takes a look, you know, inspect the x-ray. Uh, then video intelligence to identify what's going on in, in different situations, whether it's related to your endoscopy or, and, and identify uh, issues in the, in the video itself, which is like a, um, a second opinion or a digital twin for the doctors and nurse. So there, there are many applications of this. It goes back to a very simple uh, human need. You want to make more better decisions with lesser uh, cost or lesser effort. Uh, it serves that need. And that's why it's so fundamental and profound that uh, the adoption of AI uh, by all projections will be bigger than the adoption of internet. Good. That's that's something very interesting to hear that it will be bigger than the all projections of internet that you are trying to uh, say and that's really insightful. Thank you for that. Now uh, let me bring uh, Shweta to get her views here. Uh, you know, uh, a question that many businesses may be asking uh, at this stage, uh, which is, is now the time to invest in AI? So what's your views on this particular question? So uh, like uh, everybody is stressing upon it that AI definitely great tool uh, which can assist the organizations but uh, it's important for the organizations to understand whether uh, you know they are ready for the digital transformation which is required for, in terms of adopting the ai uh, ml or in analytics uh, sort of a technology and uh, the, you really have a budget for it that's very important in Many companies only following the trend, market trend, and they see that, okay, this is a new technology, let's adopt it. But are they really ready? Do they have that sort of a mindset and uh, the sort of a use case, the best fitment of the technology that is very important to understand? Uh, obviously, as I said, it is uh, very you know, important for an organization to uh, follow the trends because then it will be obsolete, uh, their processes will be obsolete and uh, looking at the market competition that is around, it is very important to be on top of uh, latest trends. So, yeah, but uh, definitely the, the most important thing is whether the organization is all geared up, are they really looking at some important new skills that can leverage the technology in the real sense. For uh, Mr. Sunil, uh, uh, you would like to add here some points uh, about uh, uh, this being the right time to invest in AI? Yeah, definitely. Uh, typically, uh, when investing in AI, one needs to also be clear about the problem that they are facing. You know, apart from one is apart from the volume of the data is just one aspect. Uh, am I audible? Am I? Uh, I mean, is it? Coming well, through, uh, clearly yeah. audible, you yeah. can okay. Yeah, all right. Thank you. So one is uh, basically uh, the volume of the data is just one aspect. The quality of the data is even more important, right? While we, uh, while there is a lot of work to be done on the big data analytics and AI around the same, the challenges come when you're using small data or data which is not very significant in data sets which are not very significant. So when the strategy, the questions then become critically important in terms of how you're going to handle that data. Now, if you look at AI itself, it can be classified into many segments, but there are two segments. One is basically you have a pure AI or uh, AI uh, general intelligence, as they call it, or artificial general intelligence, basically. And the other is the pragmatic, uh, the narrow AI typically. As well. So the pure AI or the strong AI 
is more seen in sci-fi movies. You know, it can perform any task, uh, an advanced intellectual task that you know the humans can do, learn, predict, and adapt to situation on its own. It typically uses something like GPT-3 uh, as the latest language, for example, from the OpenAI forum. But the narrow AI, uh, it performs one specific task like the customer service transactions, and typically could also be in, in the medical line um, uh, as well. So uh, see, machine learning typically is fundamental to this pragmatic AI as well. So the, the, the ML or the machine language in, is artificial intelligence, which provides the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Like you had some questions as well. So from the past, past decade, organizations are Vivek, can you hear I us? Think there's, uh, I think there's some uh, technical glitch at Mr. Kumar's end. Yeah, Vivek, sir? Uh, so, uh, yeah you can hear me right now. Yeah. Yes, yes, we can hear. We can hear. Okay, uh, okay. So I will go back to Mr. Uh, Sunil later. Uh, let me just uh, quickly get uh, some thoughts uh, uh, from Mr. Manju till then. Uh, Mr. Manju, one uh, question which uh, comes to the mind of uh, you know those who typically want to you know use uh, AI uh, and you know take them uh, or reap the max maximum benefit out of it is uh, how can someone get started with their AI journey? Because you know. If I have not used AI at all, you know, and I want to kind of use it, then what what is it that I need to do as a business entity? To, so, if you can share your views here. Yeah, so we have engaged with about roughly about 300 customers who have started or or explored or have gone deep into the AI journey, and based on all those experiences, what uh, we we would call out, let's say, five key steps, right? First is understanding uh, what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to improve efficiency or are you trying to transform your business so that you can get to the next level? The next level could be means increase your revenue or profitability, whatever that means. Second is then then how are you going to accomplish? What, are you, what use cases do you have which you want to solve? Then third is look at, do you have the right relevant data and the data is a representation of the process. Are you capturing it at the frequency, volume, velocity, whatever those factors are to, to see that. So that and now then look at uh, how do you do make your decisions today? You know, do you do it in a manual and what does that cost? Then compare that with how much would building the AI model and not just building the AI model, but managing and operating the AI model, what will that cost? Uh, and and then once this becomes evident, then now you have your ROI. At the point where your ROI is clear and evident, um, uh, and and that could be after a POC, like Pulkit was mentioning, we do workshops and POCs. So you do the workshop POCs. We convince that you know that this will solve your problem. From there on, continue the journey. What really happens in this 30, 60, 90 days that we have seen is. Once uh, the businesses, uh, the business stakeholder comprehends how this really matters, this is not just a buzzword or a hype. In some cases, it might not apply for the business, so they shouldn't use AI. But wherever it applies, once they understand how it works, it's not magical box or something, it's just a lot of math with uh, efficient compute and uh, storage and with some very good algorithms out there. Once they understand how the problems are solved better, now you already started the journey. Now, how you evolve from that is not just a technology evolution. It's also you have to make sure that the process that you have to fit in uh, also goes hand in hand. People who are the wider people in the company have to adopt it. Other, you can be the only one who is excited about this technology when the rest of them thinks it's a scary technology. So the, the ones who get the change management right, which is my last point, Eventually, I've got the AI journey right. So the and it's a it's a process, right? Uh, we have not seen anybody ramp up from zero to uh, an advanced stage in less than a year. It sometimes takes like three to four years. So, Mr. Manju, I know we are talking about artificial intelligence, but what role human intelligence will play play here in terms of preparing an organization for adopting this? You know, so if any thoughts that you would like to add to that? Humans will always have a role 
to play in uh, in intelligence uh, human intelligence will always have a role to play uh, be it on from an emotional angle or the exceptions angle uh, you can you can model there is a cost of building these ai models there's a cost of operating these ai models the cost of governing these ai models whether people imagine in the form of a moving part or a robot or just a set of algorithms running that that cost uh, and building and managing uh, doesn't justify applying building ai everywhere so you, that is one big reason why human intelligence will of course uh, apply and second is human intelligence continuously evolves Whatever baseline that we left off even one year back is not the baseline we live with today. So there's always going to be room for that continuous human evolution. The no. third is the the exception where you know there are many reasons why you wouldn't put an AI model. There yeah. is a role that will exist. So what I see in a practical world is this blend of uh, AI everywhere, but AI assisting humans. In some cases, yes, AI will clearly replace humans, but that is a smaller set than what people imagine it to be. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. That's interesting. We can't hear you. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, Mr. Sunil, I would like to uh, go back to you and get your views on the question that you were trying to answer at that time, which, is, which was about uh, yes, yeah, sorry, uh, glitch, right yeah. time to invest in uh, AI. So, can you can you continue and uh, add to what you had already shared, one or two points? Yeah, sure. So, uh, like I said, uh, uh, again, it, uh, just to add to what Manju just mentioned before I lose my thoughts, uh, is basically that uh, in the concept of AI, it is important as to where you apply this, because there's a sentimental analysis as, as well in terms of what you have. Uh, see, typically, you have autonomous cars today, so but the cars may not be trained. The flip side of it is there might be minute stones on the road or accidental accident decisions, right? So you, 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 you need to take a call, whether it is in the machine mode or in the human more kind of a thing, right? So uh, typically, when you have to, uh, you know, have a, a obstruction of four or five, four or five people on the road, and the autonomous car has to take a decision, it can either go straight and cause an accident and kill all the four people, or it can swerve to the right and only the driver can be killed uh, or the passenger uh, can be killed, right? So the passenger safety or pedestrian safety is another aspect. Image processing, like you just mentioned, the clarity of the decisions using AI, the deterministic was a non-deterministic approaches, right? So doctors can sometimes make arbitrary decisions looking at the CT scan or the MRI and, and they can also so there's ethical questions also which come into picture in use of AI as well so uh, this prevents the AI to flourish this kind of becomes the bottleneck sometimes in AI to flourish sometimes a bad decision by a doctor can turn out to be a good one for the patient but AI is not to work that way because it's always working in a certain set specified pattern right so statistically statistically speaking ai is significantly important you know uh, so you need to look at the bias avoidance aspect as well but at the same time uh, if you look at neural networks right the neural networks are inspired by neurons and they can mimic the structures but they're not like human brains and they cannot extrapolate or cannot mimic the actual neurons itself right so they can only mimic the structure so that is the difference in what we need to understand in the concept and there is also a concept of transfer learning. That means you apply a knowledge from one system, which is a simpler solution to a problem, and then take that knowledge and then apply it to a more complex system in, 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 that, in that sense, right? So typically, these are some of the things which we might want to kind of reconsider. And is it the right time to invest in A? Absolutely, yes. But you need yeah. to know where and, and how. And uh, like I said, the expectations of you, uh, the huge expectations of AI can be a lack of data, can be limited risky to invest all out into AI so that you have a combination of both non-AI and cherry-picked use cases or cherry-picked uses of AI. So they didn't identify the unknowns. And like somebody already mentioned, AI is more a journey. It's a discovery mode. And it's not an answer, to, a solution to all your problems, but it is more a tool or a means to reach your outcome as well. Yeah. Back to you, okay. Vivek. Thank you. Thank you for that. Really insightful. Uh, let me uh, now ask one very relevant question now that we have got so much information about AI, you know, its application, which uh, are the domains in which it's being used. Uh, Mr. Ravi, I would like to know from you uh, one question that, uh, you know, will again come to the mind of the people who want to use AI is how to choose the right partner for AI implementation. So what do you think, Mr. Ravi, if you can help us understand this? Yeah, so as we are, I'm from Carvey Data Management Services. I'm heading a technology for BFSA vertical. 
So what I see here in a BFSI applications, you know, at the part of our processes, we adopt so many business processes for MSMEs and SMEs and so on and so forth. NBFCs, small finance banks, be it financial inclusions, insurances, and the credit card applications, loan processing systems, and all. So in all these processes, what I've seen the lack. So the, the when you see that market, the trend vis-a-vis -vis the processes what we are trying to adopt. Uh, so this cannot be a stereotypes anymore. This we have to get along with this artificial intelligence and see that how it is going to you know benefit to the businesses and the organization. So and the customers as well. So we see that there is a uh, th there is absolutely um, you know um, time you know for uh, for artificial intelligence adoption. So in all our uh, these uh, processes. Uh, but the one thing is, you know, this is my aspect here is, you know, we have to consider those three active phases, basically. When we say that, you know, as our, uh, my uh, panel was mentioning, so when you do not have the proper data, data model, this artificial intelligence may be a failure. So I, I've seen so many organizations, they have only tried, tried and failed and given up. That's all because of lack of domain and lack of planning there. So the three active phases, what I'm saying, trying to convey is discover, we have to discover the proper use cases for artificial intelligence use cases. And we have to analyze on top of it uh, and capabilities for impact, effort and risks analysis that we have to do for those aspects. And we have to prioritize artificial intelligence use cases and capabilities and, and capabilities, you know, given dependencies and the complements uh, in the business plans. So these are the three different phases which, which any organizations have to focus now when it comes to this uh, artificial intelligence adoption yes we are now looking for a uh, for for a right uh, uh, partner you know who can uh, help us uh, sail through that uh, implementation see we have done certain things but you know that is not suffice we have wanted to move forward and do the best uh, to our customers and all and uh, right now we are in that phase so once this uh, corona this pandemic is uh, you know settled uh, in globally so probably we'll fo look forward on this aspect uh, mr Dubey. Okay, uh, so Nehal, uh, you know, I just wanted to ask you that we have some interesting questions lined up from the delegates. Uh, can I uh, can I ask them as part of the Q and A now? Yes, yes. So please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so you know, uh, I, I have got I have got a question which I will first like to ask Mr. Saurav and get his views quickly. You know, uh, the predictions. The first question for you, Mr. Saurav, is that the predictions in cost and the time saving that is projected by tech companies and their implementation partners in terms of uh, customers roi how realistic are they i mean this this is a question which has come up so if you can uh, quickly add your views here yeah thanks uh, so definitely right so uh, it's again uh, the while, while working with data analytics ai again like uh, we must have heard like we have heard from the panel is that it's a journey right so what we start with definitely it's the first part so any any ai journey that you embark upon would not be solved in a one month two months or three months a roadmap right it's a continuous journey the, where, the, where we actually take more data uh, we ensure that we understand the data we get into the domain we get the right output right but this is what has been with all the customers it's not like a technology where we learn it and we implement it right so yeah, it's always a difficult to predict the amount of cost that goes into it, but definitely the customers who have embarked upon that journey, the returns, the business returns that they have seen, okay, has been immense, like quite high that they have seen over a period, right? So definitely when you see it from a implementation cost in terms of a TPU cost or in terms of implementing, getting data science team and uh, building a COE and so on, it might look a very tedious thing to get all these things pieces together in terms of cost and ROI. But definitely it's something which over the next six months to one year, you see the power of it, the returns that you get out of it. Okay, because I'll just give an example. Uh, while working with some of the retail sectors in terms of implementation, implementing recommendations via the AI, okay, we have seen a 30% revenue growth, right? But that 30% revenue growth was not predicted. The prediction was that we would see probably a seven to 8% in the initial first year. But once we implemented, we collected the data in six to eight months, that return was seen after that. Okay, so, so it's a journey, right? You can't just say that it's, it would be in a probably a six months time frame that will start. Absolutely, absolutely. And there, there's another question which where I'll first like your views and then I will uh, engage Mr. Manju also to uh, get some Nuggets from him, uh, Mr. Saurav, please help us understand. Uh, can you please share an example of an AI predictive or descriptive 
that you have applied in your business areas or specific use cases for your organization during pandemic also if you could spell the benefits so you know if you can help us understand this uh, definitely like uh, so during the pandemic there have been two specific use cases which have been working quite well uh, one of them being the kyc the online kyc that we talk about right a uh, lot of uh, financial institutions in terms of uh, onboarding their customers they have seen a challenge as to how to verify how to do the kyc right uh, being the same person verifying the mobile number verifying the aadhar card uh, any any other documentation right so how how do you take those steps so that's where in terms of using the vision apis in terms of video intelligence and the document ai okay combining all these three things together we have seen a lot of customers and lot of financial institutes able to convert that journey which was a physical journey earlier where a person used to collect the documents verify it manually go to the house they have been able to do this journey in a much more seamless and a transparent way over a video calling okay using all these three components uh, another example i would say is about the safety of the uh, workers in the industries right because uh, we we cannot have uh, industry is being shut down for so long so we want to ensure that we have the people we have the resources coming into the industries offices working but at the same time we want to ensure that we are they are not getting impacted because of the covid thing yeah how to actually use the video capabilities right so we have the cctv streams coming in and to ensure whether anyone is detecting sorry anyone is skipping away from mask anyone is coming very close together so we have implemented those kind of solutions uh, where it actually reads out alerts okay for example if a person is not wearing a mask for continuous 10 seconds okay it's not for a few seconds but 10 seconds or more then it actually shouts that okay in this area okay we have seen a person is not wearing a mask right so that's an announcement that goes out similarly uh, any social distancing that we want to ensure so we have defined uh, a few customers as to what will be the uh, amount of distance minimum distance that should be present in between two people while the working and all this through a video stream that comes via the cctv so yes so this kind of solutions have been implemented by organizations and they have been using it effectively as opposed to just shutting down the industries like because there are a lot of industries in the uh, industrial sector where people can't work from a laptop like us okay so right. they have to visit it they have to go offices and the business has to run absolutely yeah true thank you for your views and thank you for taking you know and taking us through some interesting points here Uh, mr manju you know coming back to the roi part which is often you know uh, an area where there is lot of debate you know if you could if you want to add something about the roi part uh, uh, of the question or do you want me to tell, repeat the full question for you uh yeah can you repeat the whole question yeah, so yeah. that i can be so, very so, specific uh, the predictions uh, the cost and time savings uh, that is uh, projected by tech companies and their implementation partners in terms of customers roi how realistic are they yeah so the when you when you get on a ai journey right uh, it's and keeping in mind that it's a multi year journey yeah. uh, roi is obviously an uh, you know a debate or a question in, in people's mind uh, when industries make a move is when the roi at least the gut feel roi to start with is significantly higher when the promise is higher however when the actual investment happens even if it's an innovation Uh, it is uh, it becomes more realistic when you break the problem into smaller problems where if the model is built and you see the model you know you're able to then translate that into the number of hour let's say number of hours of labor saving okay. that's a no brainer right if you, if you if a model is able to jo- do a job 70% faster in decision making that means you save 70% of labor time so that is one bucket of uh, roi est- estimations which is believable so the uh, so those such projects move faster on the other spectrum where roi how do you assess the insights of customers sentiment when it's done at scale there is in the in the in the pre you know like without cloud or without ai if you get 50000 reviews in a day which is one of the customers that we deal with you cannot employ enough people to figure out what's your customer sentiment by reading it manually so you have to apply ai on some of these so these are now how do you justify roi in something like that everybody knows there is clear roi in that but what is the value there you'll have to come up with some newer models and and go with some estimates and and you'll never be able to prove that it's a perfect roi but the thing is 
that becomes a new norm because your competitors are doing it and your customers expect that you you keep a pulse on the sentiment one of our customers their average uh, unit price for a product is 10000 plus dollars so the expectation from the customer that if they are unhappy they expect this company to know right away and do something about it so Got it's it. a, so there are two two different spectrum to look at roi but the the simple rule of thumb is if the model solves is better than a human, you should be able to do the math and say how much you're going to save money out of it. That's one simple rule of thumb that I suggest people follow with ROI. Uh, okay. the, within that, the two components of whether you're spending that on a cloud or on a technology or on a labor, that is an easy math. You can break it down by your time horizon. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 that sounds very interesting. Uh, Mr. Manju, there is one more question, uh, which is kind of uh, you know, if I could put it, it's kind of uh, the sum of the discussion that we had, but I'd still like to uh, get some uh, value adds from you here, which is, and I'm reading that question for you, how to harness the potential for AI, analytics, machine learning, and other emerging technologies and translate into a substantial advantage? Yeah, so the, the the first of all uh, the these technologies they don't live by themselves uh, with the business outcome and the business transformation goals have to be defined first uh, some of the companies that we are working with these are very large enterprises so they in a pandemic scenario their their kpis and the management uh, targets are are significantly impacted now in a scenario like that uh, they do need to make sure that uh, the, the whole thought process of how they implement AI and how they get value out of it is thought through holistically. It's it's a world where you're entering, where, where the number of devices are going up, number of the kind of data that they is getting generated is going up uh, and the customer's expectations are changing, buying patterns are changing, your business is operating in a new environment. A lot of the business have gone, forced to become digital overnight in a scenario like that, uh, this investment and journey has become a necessity. Uh, so there is a there is there's a path that companies are evolving, which are now converging. The what was seen as abstract as digital transformation is not for me now. It's for a few years down the line, has become a become a necessity now. So the convergence of not only applying the management consulting aspect of it and of, of you know process engineering, but combining that with cloud and technology, because once you log into a cloud console, you have instant technology power of practically unlimited capacity. What can you do with that? Is the mindset that companies are digitally transforming right now? Oh, thank you, Mr. Manju. Thank you for helping us understand this question. With this, I will hand it over back to Nehal uh, to take the proceedings from here on. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Thank you so much for uh, taking up the Q and A uh, and helping us in ask, uh, you know, answering the relevant questions raised by our delegates. Uh, thank you so much to all the panel members and our speakers for a very informative uh, session. With this, we'll have the second poll of the day uh, running on the right hand side of your screens. I would request everyone to please take a look at the second poll that is going to be displayed on your screens right now. So in the meantime, you all take the second poll of the session. Let me thank Mr. Sharma for summarizing the entire panel discussion and duly helping in answering the relevant questions raised by our attendees. Truly valuable takeaways from this session. Uh, special thanks to all our speakers. Like I mentioned, really informative session and very valuable takeaways. Uh, with this, I would like to uh, bring this virtual conference to a close. Uh, before we leave, let me just remind you about, uh, you know, if you're interested uh, to uh, in a two hour discovery workshop with Pluto 7's data and AI experts, please get in touch with Pluto 7 at contact at Pluto7.com. We will just flash it on your screens uh, as well, so you can note down the email address. In case you already have, uh, you know, in case you're already on Google Cloud Platform, Pluto Seven also offers you a free two weeks assisted trial for the solutions to avail. So you can contact again the same email address that is contact at the rate Pluto Seven dot com and get in touch with Pluto Seven's team to take your queries further. Right. 
Uh, with this, I would move on. Uh, today's session wouldn't have been a success without the active participation of all our esteemed speakers, panelists and delegates. So thank you very much to all of you. I would like to thank each and every one of you for taking out time, especially for being a part of this virtual conference today. A special thanks to Google Cloud and Pluto 7 for the support in this initiative without whom this conference wouldn't have been possible. I would request you to please uh, cast in your polls before you leave for the session today. I already see a lot of you have already, you know, taken the poll. Thank you so much everyone once again. Uh, thank you. Stay home and stay safe. Thank you.